psychological types in the cultures of the Southwest. The culture of the Pueblo Indians is strongly differentiated from that of surrounding peoples. Most obviously, all aspects of their life are highly ritualized, highly formalized. No one has lived among them who has not been struck by the importance of the formal detail in rite and dance, the intricate interrelations of the ceremonial organization, the lack of concern with personal religious experience or with personal prestige or exploit. The emphasis in their all-absorbing ceremonial routine is placed where it was in the medieval Roman church of certain periods, on the formal observance, the ritualistic detail for its own sake. This is so conspicuously true for the Southwest peoples that in descriptions of their culture we have been content to let the matter rest with this characterization. Yet in a civilization such as that of the North American Indians, high ritualistic development sets no group off in any definitive fashion from the vast majority of peoples. The ritual of the sun dance, the peace pipe ceremonies, the cult groups, the age societies of the plains, or the winter ceremonial of the northwest coast, bulk perhaps slightly less prominently in the total life of these people than the calendric dances and retreats of the southwest. But it is not by any such matter of gradation that the southwest is set off from other American Indian cultures. There is, in their cultural attitudes and choices, a difference in psychological type, fundamentally to be distinguished from that of surrounding regions. It goes deeper than the presence or the absence of ritualism. Ritualism itself is of a fundamentally different character within this area. And without the understanding of this fundamental psychological set among the Pueblo peoples, we must be baffled in our attempts to understand the cultural history of this region. It is Nietzsche who has named and described in the course of his studies in Greek tragedy, the two psychological types which have established themselves in the region of the southwest, in the cultures of the Pueblo. He has called them the Dionysian and the Apollonian. He means, by his classification, essentially confidence in two diametrically different ways of arriving at the values of existence. The Dionysian pursues them through the annihilation of the ordinary bounds and limits of existence. He seeks to attain, in his most valued moments, escape from the boundaries imposed upon him by his five senses, to break through into another order of experience. The desire of the Dionysian, in personal experience or in ritual, is to press beyond, to reach a certain psychological state, to achieve excess. The closest analogy to the emotions he seeks is drunkenness, and he values the illuminations of frenzy. With Blake, he believes, the path of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. The Apollonian distrusts all this. If by chance he has any inkling of the occurrence of such experiences, he finds means to outlaw them from his conscious life. He knows but one law, measure in the Hellenic sense. He keeps the middle of the road, stays within the known map, maintains his control over all disruptive psychological states. In Nietzsche's fine phrase, even in the exaltation of the dance, he remains what he is and retains his civic name. The Southwest Pueblos are, of course, Apollonian, and in the consistency with which they pursue the proper valuations of the Apollonian, they contrast with very nearly the whole of Aboriginal America. They possess, in a small area, islanded in the midst of predominantly Dionysian cultures, an ethos distinguished by sobriety, but its distrust of excess that minimizes to the last possible vanishing point any challenging or dangerous experiences. They have a religion of fertility without orgy, an absorption in the dance without using it to arrive at ecstasy. They have abjured torture. They indulge in no wholesale destruction of property at death. They have never made or bought intoxicating liquors in the fashion of other tribes about them, and they have never given themselves up to the use of drugs. They have even stripped sex of its mystic danger. They allow to the individual no disruptive role in their social order. Certainly, in all of these traits, they stand so strikingly over against their neighbors that it is necessary to seek some explanation for the cultural resistances of the Pueblos. The most conspicuous contrast in the Pueblos 
is their outlawry of the divine frenzy and the vision. Now in North America at large, the value of ecstatic experience in religion is a cornerstone of the whole religious structure. It may be induced by intoxicants and drugs. It may be self-induced, which may include such means as fasting and torture. Or it may be achieved in the dance. We may consider first the ecstasy induced by intoxicants and drugs. For the neighboring Pima, who share the culture of the primitive tribes of northern Mexico, intoxication is the visible mirroring of religion. It is the symbol of its exaltation, the pattern of its mingling of clouded vision and of insight. Theory and practice are explicitly Dionysian. And I was made drunk and given the sacred songs. He breathed the red liquor into me are in their songs common forms of reference to the shamanistic experience. Their great ceremony is the drinking of the tiswin, the fermented juice of the fruit of the giant cactus. The ceremony begins with all religious formality and the recitation of ritual, but its virtue lies in the intoxication itself. The desired state is that of aroused excitement, and they accept even extreme violence more readily than a state of lethargy. Their ideal is to stave off the final insensibility indefinitely while achieving the full excitation of the intoxicant. This is, of course, a form of fertility and health magic and is in complete accord with the Dionysian slant of their culture. It is much commoner, north of Mexico, to use drugs rather than intoxicants for religious ends. The peyote, or mezcal bean, of northern Mexico has been traded up the Mississippi Valley as far as the Canadian border and has been the occasion of serious religious movements among many tribes. It gives supernormal experiences with particularly strong effect, no erotic excitation, very often brilliant colour images. The cult is best described for the Winnebago, where the peyote is identified with the supernatural. It is the only holy thing I have been aware of in all my life. This medicine alone is holy and has rid me of all evil. It was eaten everywhere with the object of attaining the trance or supernormal sensations which the drug can give. The Arapaho ate it in an all-night ceremony after which the effects of the drug prolonged themselves throughout the following day. The Winnebago speak of eating it for four days and nights without sleep. The Datura is a more drastic poison. I have been told by the Serrano and Cahuila of boys who have died as a result of the drink, and the Luiseño tell also the same story. It was used by the tribes of Southern California and North, including the Yokuts, for the initiation of boys at puberty. Among the Serrano, the boys were overcome by the drug during the night and lay in a comatose condition throughout the next day and night, during which time they were granted visions. On the following day, they ran a race, among the Luiseño, it seems to have been the same, four nights of trance being spoken of as excessive. The Diagüeño reckon only one night of complete stupefaction. The Mojave drank Datura in order to gain luck in gambling. They were said to be unconscious for four days, during which time they received their power in a dream. None of these alcohol and drug-induced excitations have gained currency among the Pueblos, the Pima are the nearest settled neighbours of the Zuni to the southwest and easily accessible. Tribes of the plains with which the eastern pueblos came in contact are the very ones in which peyote practices are important, and to the west the tribes of southern California share certain characteristic traits of this very pueblo culture. The absence of these traits in the pueblos is therefore not due to the cultural isolation of impassable barriers, we know, too, that the period of time during which the Pueblos and their neighbours have been settled relatively near to one another is of considerable antiquity. But the Pueblos have defended themselves against the use of drugs and intoxicants to produce trance or excitement, even in cases where the drugs themselves are known among them. Any Dionysian effect from them is, we may infer, repulsive to the Pueblos, and if they receive cultural recognition at all, it is in a guise suited to Apollonian sobriety. They did not themselves brew any native intoxicant in the old days, nor do they now. Alone among the Indian reservations, the whiskey of the whites has never been a problem in the southwest. 
When, in 1912, drinking seemed to be making some headway among the younger generation in Zuni, it was the Pueblo elders themselves who took the matter in hand. It is not that it is a religious taboo, it is deeper than that. It is uncongenial. The peyote has been introduced only in Taos, which is in many ways marginal to Pueblo culture. Datura is used in Zuni, as it was in ancient Mexico, in order to discover a thief, and Mrs. Stevenson gives an account of the manner of its use. Read in connection with her quotations on Datura poisoning and the two to four day trances of the Mojave and Mission Indians, it is a classic example of the Apollonian recasting of a Dionysian technique. In Zuni, the man who is to take the drug has a small quantity put in his mouth by the officiating priest, who then retires to the next room and listens for the incriminating name from the lips of the man who has taken the datura. He is not supposed to be comatose at any time. He alternately sleeps and walks about the room. In the morning, he is said to have no memory of the insight he has received. The chief care is to remove every trace of the drug, and two common desacratizing techniques are employed. First, he is given an emetic, four times, till every vestige of the drug is supposed to be ejected. Then his hair is washed in yucca suds. The other Zuni use of datura is even further from any connection with a Dionysian technique. Members of the priestly orders go out at night to plant prayer sticks on certain occasions to ask the birds to sing for rain, and at such times a minute quantity of the powdered root is put into the eyes, ears, and mouth of each priest. Here any connections with the physical properties of the drug are lost sight of. Much more fundamental in North America than any use of drugs or alcohol to induce ecstasy was the cult of the self-induced vision. This was a near universality from ocean to ocean, and everywhere it was regarded as the source of religious power. The Southwest is by no means beyond the southern limits of its distribution, but it is the one outstanding area of North America where the characteristic development of the vision is not found. This experience has several quite definite characteristics for North America. It is achieved characteristically in isolation, and it gives to the successful individual a personal Manitou, or guardian spirit, who stands to him in a definite lifelong relationship. Though west of the Rockies, it is often regarded as an involuntary blessing available only for those of a particular psychological makeup. Throughout the great extent of the continent, it is sought by isolation and fasting, and in the central part of the continent, often by self-torture. This vision, from which supernatural power was supposed to flow, did not by any means signify only supernormal or Dionysian experiences, but it provided always a pattern within which such an experience had peculiar and institutionalized value. And in the great majority of cases, it was these more extreme experiences that were believed to give the greater blessing. The absence of this vision complex in the Southwest is one of the most striking cases of cultural resistance or of cultural reinterpretation that we know in North America. The formal elements are found there, the seeking of dangerous places, the friendship with the bird or animal, fasting, the belief in special blessings from supernatural encounters, but they are no longer instinct with the will to achieve ecstasy. There is complete reinterpretation. In the Pueblos, they go out at night to feared or sacred places and listen for a voice, not that they may break through to communication with the supernatural, but that they may take the omens of good luck and bad. It is regarded as a minor ordeal during which you are badly frightened, and the great taboo connected with it is that you must not look behind you on the way home, no matter what seems to be following you. The objective performance is much the same as in the vision quest. In each case, they go out during the preparation for a difficult undertaking, in the southwest, often a race, and make capital of the darkness, the solitariness, the appearance of animals. But the significance is utterly different. Fasting, the technique most often used in connection with the self-induced vision, has received the same sort of reinterpretation in the southwest. It is no longer utilized to dredge up experiences that normally lie below the level of consciousness. It is here a requirement for ceremonial cleanness. Nothing could be more unexpected to a Pueblo Indian than any theory of a connection between fasting, 
and any sort of exaltation. Fasting is required during all retreats, before a participation in a dance, in a race, etc., etc., but it is never followed by power-giving experience. It is never Dionysian. Fasting, also, like drugs and visions, has been revamped to the requirements of the Apollonian. Torture, on the contrary, has been much more nearly excluded, it is important only in the initiations and dances of certain curing societies, and in these cases there is no suggestion of any states of self-oblivion. It is interesting that the Pueblos have been exposed to self-torture practices, both in the Aboriginal culture of the Plains and in European-derived practices of the Mexican penitentes. The Eastern Pueblos are in the very heart of the Santa Fe penitentes country, and these Mexicans attend their dances and ceremonies regularly and without hindrance. Much in their practice they have in common with the Indians, the retreats in the ceremonial house, the organization of the brotherhood, priesthood for the Indian, the planting of crosses. But the self-lashing with cactus whips, the crucifixion on Good Friday, are alien. Torture has not penetrated Pueblo life either from these practices or from those of the plains or of California. Among the Pueblos, every man's hand has its five fingers, and unless he has been tortured as a witch, he is unscarred. No more than the Pueblos have allowed ecstasy as induced by alcohol or drugs, or under the guise of the vision, have they admitted it as induced by the dance. Perhaps no people in North America spend more time in dance than the Southwest Pueblos. But its use as the most direct technique at our command for the inducement of supernormal experience is alien to them. With the frenzy of a Nootka bear dance, of a Quakiutl cannibal dance, of a ghost dance, of a Mexican whirling dance, their dancing has nothing in common. It is rather a technique of monotonous appeal, of unvarying statement. Always, in the phrase of Nietzsche's I used before, they remain as they are and retain their civic names. Their theory seems to be that by the reiteration of a dance they can exercise compulsion upon the forces they wish to influence. There are several striking instances of the loss, for the Pueblos, of the Dionysian significance of specific dance behavior, the objective aspects of which they still share for their neighbors. The best is probably the dance upon the altar. For the Cora of northern Mexico, the climax of the whirling dance is reached in the dancer's ecstatic and otherwise sacrilegious dancing upon the ground altar itself. In his madness, it is destroyed, trampled into the sand again but this is also a Pueblo pattern, especially the Hopi at the climax of their dances in the Kivas dance upon the altar, destroying the ground painting. Here there is no ecstasy. It is raw material used to build up one of the common Pueblo dance patterns, where two sides, which have previously come out alternately from opposite sides, now come out together for the dance climax. In the snake dance, for instance, in the first set, Antelope, dancer of the Antelope Society, dances, squatting, the circuit of the altar, retires. Snake, dancer of Snake Society, repeats. In the second set, Antelope receives a vine in his mouth and dances before the initiates, trailing it over their knees. Snake repeats with a live rattlesnake held in the same fashion. In the final set, Antelope and Snake come out together dancing together upon the altar, still in the squatting position, and destroy the ground painting. It is a formal sequence, like a Morris dance. It is evident that ecstatic experience is not recognized in the Southwest, and that the techniques associated with it in other areas are reinterpreted or refused admittance. The consequence of this is enormous. It rules out shamanism. For the shaman, the religious practitioner whose power comes from experiences of this type, is everywhere else in North America of first-rate importance. Wherever the authority of religion is derived from his solitary mental aberrations and stress experiences, and his instructions derived therefrom and put into practice by the tribe as a sacred privilege, that people is provided with a technique of cultural change, which is limited only by the unimaginativeness of the human mind. This is a sufficient limitation, so much so that it has never been shown that cultures which operate on this basic theory 
are more given to innovation than those which disallow such disruptive influences. This should not blind us to the fact, however, that the setting in these two cultures for the experience of individuality is quite different. Individual initiatives, which would be fully allowed in the one case, would in the other be suspect, and these consequences are fully carried out in the Southwest. They have hardly left space for an impromptu individual act in their closely knit religious program. If they come across such an act, they label the perpetrator a witch. One of the Zunyi tales I have recorded tells of the chief priest of Zunyi who made prayer sticks and went out to deposit them. It was not the time of the moon when prayer sticks must be planted by members of the curing societies, and the people said, Why does the chief priest plant prayer sticks? He must be conjuring. As a matter of fact, he was calling an earthquake for a private revenge. If this is so in the most personal of Zunyi religious acts, that of planting prayer sticks, it is doubly so of more formal activities like retreats, dances, etc., even individual prayers of the most personal sort, those where cornmeal is scattered, must be said at sunrise or over a dead animal, or at a particular point in a program, etc. The times and seasons are always stipulated. No one must ever wonder why an individual was moved to pray. Instead, therefore, of shamans with their disruptive influence upon communal practices and settled traditions, the Southwest has religious practitioners who become priests by rote memorizing and by membership in societies and cult groups. This membership is determined by heredity and by payment. For though in their own theory serious illness or an accident like snake bike or being struck by lightning are the accepted reasons for membership in certain societies, there are always alternative ways of joining even the curing societies so that no man with interest and sufficient means remains outside. In Zunyi, heredity is the chief factor in membership in the priestly groups, payment in the curing societies. In neither is individual supernatural power ever claimed by any member as a result of personal illumination. Those who practice curing in Zunyi are merely those who, by payment and by knowledge of ritual, have reached the highest orders of the curing societies and received the personal corn fetish, the mili. If the ecstasy of the Dionysian has been rejected in the southwest with all its implications, so too has the orgy. There is no doubt that the idea of fertility bulks large in the religious practices of the southwest, and with fertility rites we almost automatically couple orgy, so universally have they been associated in the world. But the Southwest has a religion of fertility founded on other associations. Haberlin's study gives a useful summary of the type of ritual that is here considered to have this efficacy. The cylinders the men carry and the annulets carried by the women in ceremonies are sex symbols and are thrown by them into springs or onto ground paintings. Or in the women's dance, two are dressed as male dancers and shoot arrows into a bundle of corn husks or a line of women with yucca rings, run in competition with a line of men with kicking sticks. In Peru, in a race of exactly similar import, men racing women, the men ran naked and violated every woman they overtook. The pattern is self-evident and common throughout the world, but not in the southwest. In Zuni, there are three occasions on which laxness is countenanced. One of these is in the retreat of the Tlewikwe society, which has power over cold weather. The priestesses of the medicine bundle of this society, Le Eton, and the associated bundle, Mu Eton, during one night receive lovers, and they collect a thumb's length of turquoise from their partners to add to the decorations of their bundles. It is an isolated case in Zuni, and the society can no longer be very satisfactorily studied. The other two cases are rather relaxation of the customary strict chaperonage of the young people and occur at the ceremonial rabbit hunt and on the nights of the scalp dance. Children conceived on these nights are said to be exceptionally vigorous. Dr. Bunzel writes, These occasions on which boys and girls dance together or are out together at night provide an opportunity for sweethearts. There is no promiscuity 
and they are never, never orgiastic in character. There is amiable tolerance of sexual laxity, a boys-will-be-boys attitude. It is all very far indeed from the common Dionysian sex practices for the sake of fertility. It is not only in connection with fertility and sex that orgy is common among the peoples of America. In the region immediately surrounding the southwest, there is on the one hand the orgy of sundance torturing to the east and the orgy of wholesale destruction in the morning ceremonies to the west. As I have said, torture plays a very slight role in the southwest, orgiastic or otherwise. Mourning is made oppressive by fear of the dead, but there is no trace of abandon. Mourning here is made into the semblance of an anxiety complex. It is a completely different thing from the wild scenes of burning the dead in a bonfire of offered property, and of clothes stripped from the mourners' backs that the Mojave practice, and that is found in such Dionysian fullness commonly in California, where among the Maidu, mourners have to be forcibly restrained from throwing themselves into the flames, and among the Pomo, they snatch pieces of the corpse and devour them. One Dionysian ceremony of wide American distribution has established itself in the Southwest, the scalp dance. This is the victory dance of the plains, or the women's dance, and the position of honor given to women in it, the four-circle coil danced around the encampment, the close-fitting war bonnet. Certain treatments of the scalp are the same in the Southwest as on the plains. The wilder abandons of the plains dance are, as we should expect, omitted, but there occurs in this dance, at least in Zunyi, one of the few ritual Dionysian acts of the southwest, the washing and biting of the scalp. For the repulsion against contact with bones or a corpse is intense among these people, so that it makes an occasion for horror out of placing a scalp between the teeth, whereas placing a snake between the teeth in the snake dance is no such matter. The woman who carries the scalp in the dance, the position of honor, must rise to this pitch, and every girl is said to dread being called out for the role. Ecstasy and orgy, therefore, which are characteristic of America at large, are alien in the Southwest. Let me illustrate this fundamental Apollonian bent in the Southwest by certain specific examples of the way in which it has worked itself out in their culture. There is considerable emphasis in North America upon the ritualistic eating of filth, and it is in this category that the very slightly developed cannibalistic behavior of the northwest coast belongs. That is, the emphasis there is never, as so often in cannibalism, upon the feast, nor on doing honor to or reviling the dead. The cannibal dance of the Quiacutu is a typically Dionysian ritual. It is not only that it is conceived as a dramatization of a condition of ecstasy, which the main participant must dance to its climax before he can be restored to normal life. Every ritualistic arrangement is designed, I do not mean consciously, to heighten the sense of the anti-natural act. A long period of fasting and isolation precedes the rite. The dance itself is a crouching, ecstatic pursuit of the prepared body held outstretched toward him by a woman attendant. With the required ritualistic bites, the antinatural climax is conceived to be attained, and prolonged vomiting and fasting and isolation follows. In the filth eating of the Southwest, which is the psychological equivalent to this initiation of the Kwakiutl cannibal, the picture is entirely different. The rite is not used to attain horror, nor to dramatize a psychological climax of tension and release. Captain Bork has recorded the Noeque feast he attended with Cushing, at which gallon jars of urine were consumed by the members of the society. The picture is as far from that of the Quackyutal rite as any buffoonery of our circus clowns. The atmosphere was one of coarse joviality, each man trying to outdo the others. The dancers swallowed huge decanters, smacked their lips, and amid the roaring merriment of the spectators, remarked that it was very, very good. The clowns were now upon their mettle, each trying to surpass his neighbours in feats of nastiness.
The same comment is true not only of filth-eating, but of clowning in the Southwest in general. I take it that the true Dionysian use of clowning is as comic relief in sacred ceremonial, where the release from tension is as full of meaning as the preceding tension, and serves to accentuate it. This use of clowning seems to have been developed, for instance, in the ancient Aztec rites. Now I have never seen any clowning in the Pueblos that seem to me remotely even to partake of this character, and I do not know of any description which would indicate its presence. Clowning can be buffoonery with no Dionysian implications, as we know well enough from the examples in our own civilization. It is this same use that is most prominent in the Southwest, but clowning is used there also for social satire, as in the takeoffs of agents, churches, Indian representatives, etc. And it is common, too, as a substitute for the joking relationship, which is absent here, and its license for very personal public comment. Another striking example of the Southwest Apollonian vent is their interpretation of witch power. The Southwest has taken the European witch complex with all its broomsticks and witches' animal suits and eyes laid on a shelf, but they have fitted it into their own Welton Schaung. The most articulate statement that I know of a widespread attitude is still in manuscript in Dr. Parsons' monograph on his letter. The difference for his letter between witch power and good power is simply that good supernatural power is always removed from you as soon as you have put it to the use you intended. Witch power is non-removable. It rides you for life. Their practice perfectly agrees with this. After every sacred investiture, every participant in any riot is desacretized. The unwanted, mysterious power is laid aside. Nothing could conceptualize more forcibly their discomfort in the face of mystery. Even the best supernatural power is uncanny. Their lack of comprehension of suicide is, I think, another specific Apollonian trait. The Pima tell many stories of men who have killed themselves for women, and the Plains made suicide a ceremonial pattern. Fundamentally, their vows to assume the slit sash were suicide pledges in order to raise their rank. But the Pueblos tell the most inept stories, which are obvious misunderstandings of the concept. Again and again I have tried to convey the general idea of suicide to different Pueblo Indians, either by story or by exposition. They always miss the point. Yet in their stories, they have the equivalent. There are a number of Zuni stories which tell of a man or woman whose spouse has been unfaithful, or of priests whose people have been unruly. They send messengers, often birds, to the Apache and summon them against their pueblo. When the fourth day has come, nothing ever happens in the southwest till the fourth day, they wash themselves ceremonially and put on their finest costumes and go out to meet the enemy, that they may be the first to be killed. When I have asked them about suicide, no one has ever mentioned these stories, though they had perhaps been told that very day, and indeed they do not see them in that light at all. They are ritual revenge, and the Dionysian gesture of throwing away one's life is not in question. The cultural situation in the Southwest is in many ways hard to explain, with no natural barriers to isolate it from surrounding peoples, it presents probably the most abrupt cultural break that we know in America. All our efforts to trace out the influences from other areas are impressive for the fragmentariness of the detail. We find bits of the weft or woof of the culture. We do not find any very significant clues to its pattern. From the point of view of the present paper, this clue is to be found in a fundamental psychological set which has undoubtedly been established for centuries in the culture of this region, and which has bent to its own uses any details it imitated from surrounding peoples, and has created an intricate cultural pattern to express its own preferences. It is not only that the understanding of this psychological set is necessary for a descriptive statement of this culture, without it the cultural dynamics of this region are unintelligible, for the typical choices of the Apollonian have been creative in the formation of this culture. They have excluded what was displeasing, revamped what they took, and brought into being 
endless demonstrations of the Apollonian delight in formality, in the intricacies and elaborations of organization.